yogurt in my mustache. Old people go out to eat, they, they end up wearing it. You take it home with you in your shirt and your pants. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have a somewhat empty theater here in, in uh, the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, but hopefully people will be joining us because um, we're also doing this online. And uh, today we have the wonderful pleasure of having the great saxophonist and musician and composer and uh, car engineer and racer, uh, <laughs> savant, yeah. the great Pete Chrisley. And we've had him a couple times here before with us. Uh, and you have to forgive me, normally someone's helped me run this, but I am doing all this stuff here today by myself. So it's a lot, just one second, let me get things started here so that I can answer any questions that you guys have. And okay, so, um, for those of you who've never joined us before, this is part of a weekly series that we do. Um, and uh, that being said, we're the third Sunday of every month here at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. And it's always with a different guest artist and always uh, brand new original material, kind of a composer's workshop, if you will. So um, again, we have the wonderful Pete with us today. And in the last couple of interviews, um, well, number one, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here today. Thank you. It's, it's, it's nice to be out of the house. <laughs> yes, we all can and, relate. And playing too, I might add. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we're happy to have you here today, and, we, and excited, we just and uh, never always, get enough of that. Yeah, you know, uh, excited and terrified as usual to share the bandstand with you. Oh, so that's not that. that no, no, you've been showing me the road a long time. <laughs> Well, the, the, the last couple of interviews, I mean, if, if no one has watched any of the interviews, go, go back and check them out because they're on YouTube. Um, and Pete has a lot of wonderful things to say about how he got it started playing and um, his youth and upbringing and his musical family. What I wanted to ask you today is um, kind of dig in a little bit on some of your experiences on the road and in um, some of the um, studio work that you've done. Because a lot of people will never have those experiences and they'll kind of wonder, like, I wonder what that was like, you know, to do that, if that's I, all right with you. I feel that... Uh, the road opportunity was, uh, it was very important to have been involved with all that. And um, I, w I managed to play with, uh, the, the first, very first road experience was uh, a guy who was a trombone player for many years at, at MGM. And when my father worked at MGM in the 30s and late 30s and and early 40s. Uh, this guy, his name was Cy Zentner, and uh, he, he was a real character. Uh, he was a handful. He uh, uh, he had a, a hit that a guy that I ended up playing in his band and, and playing with and produced a record for Bob Florence, wrote that arrangement of uh, Up a Lazy River. And it was a, pr a a big enough hit that he, this guy launched his band, and I was not on the very first band. No, I was just a youngster coming up. I was like, uh, wow, uh, 17, 18, maybe, maybe 17. Um, so it was, uh, it was okay riding on a bus. Uh, when you get to be a, an, an old guy, then it's not that comfortable riding on a bus, you know. But uh, and, and sleeping on a bus, you know. How did the opportunity even arise for you to join the band? How did that come about? Well, so, somebody hears you play and 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 they recommend you. Um, and uh, that's what I tell people now. That's it's it's kind of like uh, full circle. Like if you if you uh, people say, well, how do you go out and you get work? Well, you know. Um, I played in people's bands. There were rehearsal bands. Guys had bands. There was, in my area, there was uh, more bands than gigs, and it's and it's it's even worse now, <laughs> you know. But uh, uh, if you get in a band and people hear you play, then next thing you know, somebody hears you, and, and and now you're playing with this band and that band, and then that, now you're playing with three. When we were lived, Linda and I were playing in two or three. Uh, bands a week and uh, one of them for me was uh, 
um, Holman's band, which I did 20 years of that, you know, and uh, Bill, the great Bill Holman. And uh, uh, it was, my, the first gig was uh, uh, Seisetner's band. We went, we flew to Chicago, and uh, it was winter time, and I've never experienced that kind of bitter cold getting rocking out the door of an airport and it's 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 below zero outside you know i wanted to go back and, and go home already you know but um i was playing uh, uh the jazz chair luckily uh um i think that's why i was there but uh, i had to learn how to play the clarinet to get the gig, and uh, there wasn't much flute, but I had a flute with me. But I had to learn how to play, play just play the clarinet enough. So, fortunately, in those old bands, the clarinet, the the, the real uh, clarinet parts, the hard ones, uh, were always in the alto chair, in the uh, lead alto chair, had lead clarinet, and, and he had a this guy, he had definitely had to take private to hold his job. He, I took my first lessons were with uh, my father's stand partner at uh, 20th Century Fox, and he was one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest, legit uh, soprano saxophone player. They had the Hollywood Saxophone Quartet, which was second to none. Their records are still, they're, they're, I still have their, their CDs and records and things. And, uh, and the, the, they were great at, at uh, Debussy and literature, tough literature. They, were, they, were, they could play anything, these guys. At any rate, that, uh, I, got, I got to play on that band. I was, out, I was there for most of, of, a, uh, of a year, probably a year. And we went across the country maybe two or three times. Seems like, uh, uh, I always remember it, it takes at least two days to get through, from, to go, to go through Texas. <laughs> it's, it's like you never leave Texas, you're there. Are we still in Texas? Yeah, the sun went down, the sun came up, you're still in Texas, you know. But, um, and then we played in places I'd never dreamed I would be playing them, the Catskills, because uh, we were playing dance music, a lot of dance music, not very few. Uh, I was a, a kind of a, a, a realization that um, really well-written dance music uh, is great to listen to, you know, when you listen to... Uh, like for instance, uh, Benny Goodman's band or something like that. You know, they swung, they swung, they had a ball. And whoever wrote those charts, they knew how to swing. You know, in fact, uh, we we rehashed a few of those old things, and when we had our ten-piece band going, and we had arrangements of those things, just because they they swung, it was fun to play. You know, well, anyway, that was uh, my first band experience, and so I. Uh, he even he, he was a loose cannon. He he once in a while he just he wanted to drive the bus, <laughs> and so that was uh, we were all in in uh, grave danger. <laughs> uh, he hit a tree in the road, and uh, so he did drive the bus. Oh God, what a pain! Anyway, um, I left size band, and it was like. You know, word of mouth, and I was I was working at, when I, I left Size Band. I came back to L.A. and I got a job right away with a um, with a, a guy that uh, his name was Bobby Bryant, and he uh, was a great trumpet player. And he came from Chicago, and I played in a small group with two tenors, organ, Hammond organ, drums, and and uh, him lead a trumpet player and it was fun we it was a battle every night you know the tenor battle you know and so that uh 
But it, what, what happened was that Bobby recommended me for a gig in Vegas with, uh, right away with uh, uh, Della Reese. And the tenor player on, on the other tenor player on the gig was, he was wonderful, uh, great old tenor player, very well known, Jimmy Forrest was his name, who actually had, had the accolade of actually um, uh, writing a few standard tunes, you know. Uh, anyway, it, it was fun to play with him. And Buddy Childers was the trumpet player, and you know Buddy Childers was a famous trumpet player with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, and then he came to L.A. and he had his own band. But he was in this band with me, the two tenors and trumpet, and, and Della Reese, and he had, uh, he was quite a bit older than me, and he had been on Woody Herman's band, and Woody Herman's band was playing down the road at the Tropicana, and he went to see, on a break, he went to see them, and he he came back and he said, you know, uh, Joe Farrell leaving uh, Woody's band and they're looking for a tenor player. He says, so I, I th threw your name in the hat. I said, well, thank you. You know, next thing I know it, I get a call. So I go to, uh, I go to, to uh, play with the band and they, it, it was luckily, like they, they were playing in a, in a new, new club in L.A. Um, yeah, uh, right in, uh, in Beverly Hills. It was a, a brand spanking new club. And, and Buddy Rich's band had opened a couple of weeks before us. And then we went in there. And I, I had heard, you know, I had all the records. I had, uh, you know, how, can you imagine following... Uh, Sal Nistico, you know, who played like a like a machine gun. <laughs> he, he couldn't he couldn't play that, you know. He was a monster, you know, but quite a an interesting character. Um, but I had all those solos down. I had all the records, and I and I I played the first night. I played in Woody's band, and sitting in front of me was. Right, I mean, the, the chairs were right up against the, those silly little band, cardboard bandstands, you know. Yeah. Actually, these were made out of plywood or balsa wood or something. If you kicked one, the whole thing went on the ground like that, right? Anyway, uh, Louis Belson was sitting right in front of me and Dizzy Gillespie. So uh, here's Al Gibbons. The, the lead tenor player, you know, th that was always the thing. You know, like Stan Getz was the lead tenor player, and then there was uh, 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 Jimmy Drewfree and Al Cohen, and then Serge Charloff. Uh, anyway, uh, um, uh, w w Al had this Stan Getz kind of thing, and uh, I, of course, been all my favorite. All my favorite, like Cannonball was one of my, my biggest influences just because he, he could do anything, you know. It was, and meeting him was a, tr oh man, it was like, you know, he was, it was a big, it was as big as life as there he was, and he was, and he was so humble and it's so cool. He treated you right, right off the bat, he treated me, you know, I just went up and I just shook his hand. I, I was a little kid and I said, when I, uh, when I grow up, I want to play just like you. And he looked at me and he says, young man, you look just like Don Drysdale. And it was a pitcher with the L.A. Dodgers, right? And everybody's laughing. He says, but I, listen, he said, I'll bet you, I know you can play. Anyway, uh, so the witty thing was, was uh, off and on okay and then weird because we were on the road and it was a period of time you know when I was listening to the band they were playing every hot jazz festival and they had they had the records going they were the band you know uh, it was like all of a sudden uh, momentum when Buddy Rich started his band they got they, they got hot and they, they they had a couple of records and next thing you know they're they're the band to go listen to 
But um, uh, so Woody's band was kind of like, uh, they're kind of uglying away, you know. Woody was 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 getting old, and he, he just he just he rode on the bus, and then he decided he was tired of riding on the bus, so he got him a a Corvette, and he just drove to gig to gig in his Corvette, and we were on the bus, and there was a lot of uh, unrest, and uh, we weren't playing we weren't playing any jazz gigs. The uh, uh, the booking agency just wanted to keep the band on the road, keep it going, because they were making whatever money. You know, they were still there was still money being paid. They were taking a percentage, basically, you of all bet. the gigs. Yeah. Big percentage, and we were playing dances. We played <laughs> we played most of the same places that I played in the little dance hall theater places in the Midwest and all over the country that uh, that I was playing with with uh, Cy Zentner's band, you know. In fact, I, you know, you could see your name on the wall that you wrote your name here, you know, you're back again, you know. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Things haven't changed. And so uh, uh, that ugly the way because I, uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole thing was that this two-week gig in L.A. was uh, a wonderful experience, and I thought I was really uh, taking care of business. And uh, the band was going, to, Woody's band was going to Europe, and then they, um, uh, Woody says, uh, I want to talk to you. I figured, well, hey, you know, maybe he's so happy with me he's going to, give me a raise or something like that instead of 200 a week, you know, to $205 a week, you know. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and so <laughs> he says, oh, well, you know, we're going to, uh, tomorrow we're going to uh, Europe. You know? I said, yeah, I already got my, uh, I showed him my, you know, my vaccination. You know, they, in those days they, they branded you, you know. And, uh, and then, and I got my passport, you know, I said, Bucky Beaver, hey, yippee, you know, he says, you're not going. I said, well, I, I, uh, whoa, you know, what? You know, he says, well, we're going to Europe and nobody knows you and Sal Nistico wants to go and, and uh, nobody knows you, so he's going to go and you're going to stay home. So, uh, see Abe and get your money and uh, Abe was a chiseler and, and, and a, a criminal, a total criminal. Uh, he absconded with, with the money. He, 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 he was notorious, and 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 you never got your money. I mean, uh, I found out the hard way because for me, the, uh, here I was at home, and um, uh, I was just hanging around because there wasn't much going on, and I I had been out on the road, and I hadn't got a lot of things going in town you know that's so if you live in LA and then you go out and, and you spend a lot of time on the road it, it heals over and they don't know you anymore you know you have to start over and so especially with a, a town with so many 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 musicians and there they got all the gigs and uh, you walked away you know so um, I got uh, I got a call from Buddy Rich's band, and, and, I, and I, I knew already that what kind of a situation it would be with Buddy Rich. He wasn't a very pleasant guy to work with. You'd heard the bus tapes oh, already. Oh, I heard the bus tape. Yeah, you know. At first you laugh, and then you think I could have been there. Yeah. Right. You could have been sitting there and get a, things bouncing off your forehead, insults, and so. Um, I got the call from, I said, well, I don't know, I, I, let me think about it. And then the next call, next call, it was the manager from, uh, uh, Bill Byrne was his name, and, 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 and he was uh, the manager for Woody Herman, and you hear all this interference in the background because they're calling from Switzerland or somewhere. He says, hi, this is Bill Byrne, hi, well, what do you, I said, yeah, well, okay, uh, he said, what do you want to do back on the band? I said, 
well, I thought you had the great Sal Nistico. He said, well, Sal got off the plane and disappeared, and we never saw him. We, we, we're using some guy here, you know, we're just waiting to get back and uh, waiting for you to get back on the band. I, 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 was, you know, I was like, well. Did you tell him $210 then? A week? I said, I want $250 clear. And Woody was listening by the phone, and I hear Woody saying, Jesus Christ, he says, Stan Getz didn't get 250 clear. And then Bill Bird says, yeah, w Woody said that'd be okay. Jeez. You know, I'm, uh, I'm amongst thieves, you know. And so, for some silly reason, I went back on the band. And then and it was really bedlam because the guys were just... Oh, if, if we were riding someplace on the bus, it was hell to pay. It was like being in a monkey cage, you know? And, uh, and this time, I went back, and I was playing the Bermuda Triangle chair. No jazz, no lead, no nothing. You know, my part on uh, Woodchopper's Ball was uh, da la la da 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 Same note for three weeks, you know? And so... Um, uh, it only took a while when I finally decided that I wasn't getting to play, and so I just said, "I'm, I'm out of here." You know. And uh, so I came back to town, and guess who calls? A buddy of mine on uh, Louis Belson's band, and Louis says, "Man, I walk into the rehearsal. He says, I thought you were out with, 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 with Woody." And I said, "Well, it didn't work out, and." I'm glad I'm here. Nice to see you. You know, I said, well, he was a Louis was like a, a father to everybody. He was the uh, most wonderful guy. Um, I had, off and on for over 20, 30 years, I was playing with Louis Belson in L.A. You know, and uh, he told me that that night. He told me that that night at the at the Shea, that's the name of that club that we were at in West Hollywood, that uh, he was sitting next to Dizzy Gillespie and Dizzy, and I was playing, and, and Al Gibbons was playing, and he leaned over to, uh, Dizzy leaned over to Louie and says, how come the white guy sounds like the black guy and the black guy sounds like the white guy? <laughs> <laughs> now that's interesting, huh? It's a compliment, you know. I did end up at one time uh, when I was playing rehearsal bands in L.A. before all this started. Played uh, a, a place called Small's Paradise, and Small Tommy Small had a club in New York City. It was a very big nightclub, jazz club, and he had one in L.A. And I was playing the, the one in L.A. And I, I was playing in this band. This guy's name was Billy Brooks. A little character had a, uh, a, a, tr a trumpet with a bell that went like that, straight up. I think Dizzy had one like that, too, at one time. But uh, He wasn't a, the greatest trumpet player in the world, but he, he, and, and he was four feet tall. And, but he was a hustler, and we got gigs. So we got this gig playing for Dizzy's birthday. And here I am up there playing, yeah, yeah, I'm 16 years old, I'm playing uh, Manteca, right? Da, 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 da. I'm playing Manteca, next thing, there was some, something that, I turned a little bit to, Dizzy got up on the stage, he had his horn, he was scared the hell out of me. <laughs> My knees were shaking, man. <laughs> anyway, um, the Louis Belson experience was, went on forever, and, uh, um, we were on the road with Pearl Bailey, and people say, uh, "Are you military?" And, and I, I, I say, "Well, some people survive Pearl Harbor, and I survived Pearl Bailey." <laughs> and they look at me like, "Who the hell's Pearl Bailey?" You know, but uh, um, like I. I I fell asleep one because I was. They were. Well, the gig started in Denver. My first gig with Louis Ben, and we had a bunch of the, the jazz charts, and I got to play. But we all, we all her, her, her act. Yeah. She sang and danced, and she was, you know, ended up on Broadway for ten years doing. 
Uh, hello, Dolly, I think. Right. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, I was, they were stuck in, in, in a snowstorm, in the worst snowstorm in the history of Chicago for, for six, seven days. To, to call, uh, the, the airport was frozen, closed, and we were in a, staying in a, in a hotel in downtown Denver, and I was wandering around finding places to play, you know. Right? You want, to go, you want to sit in and play, right? And it's sitting in, man. So I found this joint, and, and it was organ, and, and uh, it, the, the door didn't even open until 2 in the morning. It's one of those after-hours clubs, you know. And, and Earl DeWitt was an organ player, fine organ player, good drummer. And they like, I, they, right away, I, I hit it off with these guys, you know. You coming tomorrow night? Yeah, you know. Yeah, I'll be there. I was, I, I, had, I had a steady gig. And then they finally got to, to, uh, you know, uh, Denver, and then uh, we have a rehearse her show and everything. But I've been up for days playing. I, I kind of nodded out, and she, she came over and she, bam, she hit me, and I, like. Right there, and I went, brrr, and the whole saxophone section went, bam, boom, bam, crash, boom. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Louis said, "What are you doing?" So she uh, later on she bought me a nice sweater. And I was on that gig for a year. I got about forty sweaters out of it. <laughs> you know. Anyway, um, well, I wanted to ask you. There's a couple questions. Um, what was the question? Well, the question was how you got started going on the road, like how that whole thing came about. But I wanted well, to... Well, it's been one to another yes. to another. If you're here and you're on the road, and, and all of a sudden the word gets out, and then, you know, so you have to make yourself visible. And, uh, and I tell kids, uh, you know, get in a band, play. If nobody... If no, how are you going to get... Somebody to call you to play if they have never heard you or and and and, and you don't exist so I wanted to ask you because you mentioned this before and we've talked about this um, you told the story about being on the road with Chet Baker and of course he did you dirty and you didn't get paid oh and all this but how did you how did you get the call to play with Chet Baker how did that come about well uh, it was a, a recommendation. Uh, from somebody, um, a friend or an enemy? Well, now I'm, I'm I got to think, you know, because I didn't know what I was getting into. I, all I know that Chet Baker was. Uh, there were two records in my house when I was a little kid, before I got my first beginning wind saxophone. You know, the one in a case that smelled like a cat pooped in it. <laughs> and um, it, that one record was 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 uh, Tex Panicky and the Miller Band, and I liked the way he played. He 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 had a little bit of that uh, Coleman Hawkins kind of feel to it, big guttural sound, and he played really well. And uh, um, I ended up meeting him and. And, and he liked me, and I ended up playing a few gigs around L.A. with the Miller Band, you know. And he was the nicest man. Anyway, uh, um, Chad Baker and Jerry Mulligan was the other record. And uh, I, I was amazed at, uh, you know, take, taking away the fact that the first hardest lesson you'll, you'll learn when you go on the road with a with a junkie is that you should have got your money in front because there's hell to pay, you know. Uh, most of the time, I'm sorry I don't have all the money, or you know, and you know where that money went. So, but he, you know he did that to everybody, and uh, I don't have any reservations about saying that I I do not believe that he fell out a window in Holland, I think he was launched for uh, not paying for something. And so anyway, uh, uh, 
So you, you don't but know who, you know who gave you the recommendation? Was insane. It was like this guy would, he didn't read a note, but he played beautifully and he, he would, whatever, you know, if he, he got, got rolling playing, he, he would play damn near a whole chorus in one breath. I mean, it just kept flowing and flowing and flowing. Now there, if anything, it was, was worth the beating I took. <laughs> It was being exposed to that kind of, of uh, brilliance, that, that, that natural thing that he had. What were the expectations in that band? Was there a lot of uh, um, instructions that he gave you, or was there music, or was there a music it director? It was just or? a band put together that played together right off the bat. Yeah. I mean, first of all, um, uh, Chuck DeMonico was the bass player, and he ended up being the toast of the town in L.A. for many years before he passed away. Great jazz player, great reader, ended up in the studios. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dave Mackay was a, a wonderful piano player. Dave was blind, and every once in a while, Chet would, would get mad and turn around at Dave, and he say, Dave, don't you see what we're trying to do here? And everybody would, you know, now there's a joke if there was one, you know. But And then the, the drummer was a guy who was in the United States Air Force. He was a, a, a very high up, worked in the uh, Strategic Air Command Tunnel, was responsible for helping design uh, that big board, that you know, the thing, that screen, that the world is in front of you and you're watching activity all over the world. I mean, he was part of that. You know, he was an inventor. But he played, I swear, he played like Philly Joe Jones. He was fantastic drummer. And I was, and here was, here was, he was, he was dressed impeccably and everything and I, he sat down at the drums and I said, oh, well, here we go, you know. Goody two shoes, but he, all of a sudden, it started swinging like crazy. And um, Harry Kivas was his name. And so uh, that ended because I, I, I was in a hotel and I couldn't pay my bill because I, didn't, I wasn't getting any money and I was running out of time, you know. And I, t I, I had to you know, hi mom, hi dad. Things are going great, but I need to. Um, uh, I'm out of money. I need to get home. <laughs> you know. Well, I guess I guess wanted to, what I wanted to ask is when you're with those guys, was there much like if they they must have told you, oh, we're going to play X Y Z tunes, right? And did you know these tunes, or if you didn't know the tunes, was there music, or how did that all come about when you're working with someone like Chet Baker? Well, it was just like uh, Chet played. Oh, he played as. as Standard tunes, yeah. and then uh, uh, and and if I wanted to play one of my tunes, uh, one of the tunes that I liked and he didn't know, I'd take him over in the corner and I'd say, "Here, you're done." done. I play this, and then we go here, and we go that, and boom, boom, and he go in here, and uh, he got it. Yeah. He was like, and you know who else was like that? Buddy Rich didn't read a note when he came to to, to play on the Tonight Show because Johnny. Carson was an amateur drummer, and he loved drummers, and he and he liked to f play drums, you know. And um, he had Buddy on the show, and so if if we had a tune Buddy was going to play on the show, then we'd run it through once with Ed Shaughnessy up there, and Buddy'd sit there and listen to it, and then they'd run it down with Buddy, and he had it down, just like that. So but amongst the rhythm section when you're playing with Chet, they just kind of figured out a lot of that stuff on the fly. They figured out a tune they wanted to play and then came up with arrangements just... Yeah. Oh, yes. I can't... You know, it was so long ago, I don't know if there was actually any paper at all. I don't think there was any paper at all. It was just Chet. It was just, we're going to play this. And, and uh, it just came off... Uh, it, it couldn't help but come off with the right people. It, you know, you get people together who could play, and you don't need any music. You, you know, there's, there's a language, a common language, kind of thing, that's floating between this thing that that everybody knows that you're going to do this, and when you do this, you, little signals ahead turns this way, 
a guy does this or plays this, or the drummer goes bop and boom, and everything just seems to want to know uh, or already know what's going to happen next. You know, and um, there's a word for that. It's about this long, and my my best friend, bass player Jim Huard's family was lived in, in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and his his uh, cousin was graduating PhD, getting a PhD. I mean, he was in school uh, for 10, 15 years to get that, you know. I mean, it seems like school never ends. He's, he's losing his hair, but he's going to get, but his PhD is going to be right here, you know. And uh, it, he, he did his thesis <coughs> because his father was Biddy Bastian, who was a, the jazz bass player in Minneapolis and played with Teddy Wilson and all these guys who came through town. And they'd have a rehearsal, and they'd, they'd and that long word was the word that described the, the, the language, the, the communication of how, how to communicate. Um, and what you're doing is you're, sh you're shortcutting uh, the manufacturer of a, of a product uh, and cutting all the baloney and making it happen almost instantaneously. And so he came to Los Angeles and had all these smartest people, in the, all these PhD genius people, like maybe 500 of the smartest people on the planet. He was going to explain how this works, and it's something, it's, it's, a, it's a revolutionary way to think. And he's getting it through us, playing jazz. So he went up there, he had us play jazz. And then they took us in a room, and they said, that was just absolutely wonderful. How do you, how do you, how, how do, you do that? And, and they, the guy asked me, well, uh, what is your uh, motivation behind this? And I said, play horn, get check. Yeah. <laughs> the place went up. And <laughs> the, the, the calamity didn't stop for about five minutes. People were on the floor, you know. I said, so... Uh, that kind of says it all, you know. Play horn, get check. <laughs> we're, we're getting we're getting close to that time where uh, did we, we say anything important? Well, I, uh, what was the, the next question? Well, before I ask another one of my questions, if anybody listening or in the audience here, the audience here has any uh, questions for you, um, Pete, go ahead and put them in the comments, um, or and any questions. So if there are any questions, put them in the comments, and I'll do my best to get to them here. Sometimes there's a bit of a delay in receiving them here. Um, but I wanted to ask you, on the flip side of Chet Baker, and no rehearsing, listening, showing up, and just making things happen in real time, yeah. um, the other side of that where we have arrangers, where they're writing things down and having things just so. Now, you've played in many, many wonderful bands with um, wonderful arrangers. Who are some of your favorite arrangers and things that you've played and why? Well, uh, uh, the most dynamic, the, the most important uh, things that I, I, I was involved with, uh, m when my teacher Bob Cooper passed away, uh, uh, he was the first tenor player in Bill Holman's band, and they naturally called me. And uh, I was honored to do it. And, um, Bill was very, very unique. Nobody writes like Bill Holman, you know, and he, uh, uh, he wrote, he wrote things for guys in the band. Duke Ellington wrote things for guys in the band. Everybody in Duke Ellington had feature spots that they did, you know, and that's the way the, the Holman thing was, but um, it's amazing. When we, like we did un the album Unforgettable with uh, Natalie Cole, Bill Holman did four or five very, very important charts on that monster CD. They were, there were a dozen writers, because there was, if you know them, there's, there's more tunes on that CD than you could get on a CD. 
but they're on there. Yeah. And uh, he just has a way of doing things. And uh, it looks like it's, it's, it, it's all going to work out because he knows what, he knows what to do. Yeah. It's just going to be his, and it's going to be <laughs> abstract and fun to listen to. That's the one thing about playing his band. If you get listening to it, you're, you're going to get lost because everybody's got a very intricate thing of their own, you know. So uh, it's not an easy band to play in, you know. And then there was, uh, God, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I, I worked with guys, uh, you know, um, a guy named who wrote beautiful symphonic and great charts for for uh, Frank Sinatra, and his name was Don Costa. Beautiful arrangements, and he actually was a guitar player by trade. And uh, anybody wants to be a writer could be a writer if they really want to be a writer. That you know, I've written a few things, besides the bad checks. You know, I mean, uh, there was a, a place to for somebody who could write to write for the Tonight Show. I wrote one tune. That's why I tell these kids when I say, I wrote one tune for The Tonight Show. And there were guys who were great writers. Tommy Newsom could write symphony orchestra stuff. And John, John Bambridge, who played in my band, wrote a lot of charts for us. Like somebody would show up to the show without music, to The Tonight Show. People were that stupid. They'd, they'd, they'd actually go to a <coughs> world-famous show without any music and say, well, let's do something, you know. Well, what do you want to play? What, do you, what would you like to sing? Well, I, I know this tune. I can sing that tune. Either Tommy or John. Oh, Doc would say, uh, uh, oh, over here, phone. Now, we are, we're rehearsing, right, at 3 o'clock. And the rehearsal's over at uh, uh, 4.30 or something like that. Cameras go off, everybody goes away, and we come back at 5.15 for the show. So in that time, uh, John or Tommy would be in a room with a, and, 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 and doing this. This page, and there's a, a copyist this is sitting pre, right here. pre-finale. This is all by hand and all score paper. Hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's going to the copyist, going to the copyist, going to the copyist. And just, because he got it up here. And then, boom, 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 it's going to be three minutes. No, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, certain stars get more than th three minutes. Very rarely, because they, they have to sell these commercials. It's a, it's a commercial entity. That's how they make their money. They sell uh, commercials were 17000 a minute when we started. They were $100,000 a minute when we ended 20 years later. So time is money, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, learning to write is, a, a, number one, it's a, a very lucrative thing you could have, in, and, and, and the other thing is that you have so much more of an understanding of what's going on around you and musically, and it influences the way you think and believe me, Bob Brookmeyer and Jerry Mulligan were great writers, and they were great players. Prolific, melodic, beautiful players. And they wrote beautiful music. You know, Bob, wow. They took him into some beautiful college, and I think in Switzerland or somewhere, he taught uh, exclusively taught, taught jazz, you know. You will play jazz and you will like it. Anyway, so that, that, that's the, the gist of it. And um, I just, the only thing I, I, I wish there was more opportunities for kids to actually get the, the kind of hands-on uh, 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 experience of growing up and living this, this thing, being part of it. I, you know, when I wanted to play, I was started out on the violin, and I, and, and, and I was playing the violin, and you know, the first teacher, my father was my first teacher, really. My first teacher would hand me something, and he said, I want you to play that, and then come back, and I'll listen. And my father would work with me, and uh, uh, being a great 
musician, one of the elite who could play uh, with Stravinsky. And he was in our house all the time, Stravinsky, and, uh, and, uh, and then all the other, and then they went into modern 12-tone music, and, 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 and I was around music all the time, but my heart was, when I heard those two records, that was it, man. I said, I want to swing. I want to have fun swinging. That's, now, now you're talking, you know. Yet, first of all, you get the opportunity to make up your own music and swing at the same time. So that was my motivation for, for doing that. And, and believe me, uh, the violin never had a chance, you know. <laughs> But what about Stefan Grappelli? Come on, come on. So, well, th th that was a, a, a revelation. He, you know, the, the guy, the real guy, was Joe Venuti. Yeah. And the stories about Joe Venuti, all the, the humongous things that he did. I call a thousand bass players for a gig, and a, they all show up on a corner. And he's up a, in a hotel room looking at all these guys going, who called me? Did you call me? Huh? What, you know. Like that, and all, oh boy, there's a lot of stuff we can't talk about because it was just, in, you know. Oh, one, Joe Venuti, a gig, um, and uh, uh, he was in the pit and there was a piano player tapping his foot. So he got out a hammer and a nail and he got under the piano and he grabbed the guy's foot and nailed his shoe to the floor. <laughs> True story, because uh, his wife was about 90 years old, and she was coming to all these concerts my mother and father were putting out, jazz concerts and, and, and um, classical concerts and stuff. And she would be at all of them, and I asked her, I said, are all those stories true? And she says, every damn one of them. <laughs> well, Pete, there's a question here. Really quickly, the, there's a question for you. Um, it's... In regards to the gentleman you mentioned earlier who got the PhD, was that PhD in music theory, or what was what was the PhD for? What was the focus? Well, uh, I don't think so. It was business, business administration. That's why they lacked the uh, quote about and the that's, check. And that's and that's why. Uh, I mean, it's just, this is a, a way to promote. Uh, what it was, the idea was to be able to, to produce a product, cut through all the red tape, and get to the, to, the, to the, you know, go right to this guy, and right to this guy, and right to that guy, and get the job done. We don't have to have, uh, you know, a quorum and discuss ideas and theories and stuff. Let's just make this thing. That's yeah, the way race car guys are. There's a lot of committees for things these days. Committees, committees. upon committees upon committees, and yeah. nothing gets done, but money is spent. <laughs> a lot of lunch, free lunches. So, yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah, business, that was, he was in a PhD in, in business administration or something uh, that's too quaint for what it really is, but that's what he was there for, what he spent half his life in college for. I don't know what he's doing with it now. I mean, when I was in school, I couldn't, I left school and went on the road with a band because I had no idea what, uh, 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 what all this other stuff that you're trying to tell me that I need to stay home and, and, and learn all this stuff and learn and, and, and do all this and do it, which has nothing to do with what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's why I quit school and went on the road with a band when I was 16, 17 years old. I wish it was that way for other kids, but I mean the kids now, but what I tell them is that here's the, here's the, the, the trade. Now, there are a lot of things that I would have learned in, in college, other skills and things that, that would be in my life usable and made me, you know, a better person. I don't know, and that's impossible. Uh, <laughs> But, you know what I'm saying? The knowledge that you gain from, you know, being uh, in college and getting a big slice of what the world's really like and what you 
what you need to do to uh, succeed. You know, uh, motivation. Uh, I don't know. I, um, all I can say is keep an open mind because uh, uh, you know I listen to a lot of great players in my life. I mean. Uh, you know, I was around a few. I, I got to work, a, a play, a, a do an album with, uh, in a band with, uh, with Gene Almonds. And Gene Almonds, uh, uh, taking away from the, 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 last, the f last few years, which he was commercialized and doing a lot of stuff that, uh, when you heard Gene Almonds and Sonny Stitt play, you were hearing the real thing. I mean, they were roar. And he had a sound, he had the most beautiful sound. It was like a tree trunk that wide, you know. And, uh, and he played, and his soul was playing a ballad, you know. He could put the right note in the right place and just go, wow. And you go, yeah, you know, ooh. <laughs> One of those go, ooh. That's a, a guy, you go, ooh, that's, you know that's good. <laughs> I have I have tons and tons of more questions. We'll have to do another interview because we're we're getting short on time here. Um, I want to ask you before we conclude, and I've asked you this before, but it's a new day, and maybe you have a different different perspective on things. Maybe you don't. I don't. Um, <laughs> if let's you, try. If you were um, going, if someone was coming to you and they were talking to you about taking undertaking becoming a musician or having a life in music, uh -huh. um, what advice would you give to them? That's something that you found personally very helpful for you in the formation of you and your life in music and being helpful uh, for you? The, the versatility, um, the first thing I, I, I'd say is uh, for a, a saxophone player, the quality work, the, the work, if you want to make a, a, a living, let's see, we are jazz players and we're used to people saying we are. Uh, you're going to be playing for the door. Uh, you can't live in this world and exist. And I mean, you, you can't exist unless you have certain amount of money coming in to support you. And if you want to be a musician, here's the criteria. If you're a saxophone player, you you will be uh, uh, well advised to study and 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 be the best clarinet player, the best flute player. If you are ambitious and and courageous, you will learn how to play a double reed because the double reed players are working almost every day somewhere because. They need a double reed player who can play the saxophone and the clarinet and the flute and all this stuff, but they need a double, double reed player because uh, it's just... And my father was very busy teaching people how to play bassoon, believe me, and, and a, a lot of them uh, did very well. But the versatility thing. And then, on top of that, for a saxophone player, um, if, you, if you know how to write, you can make, you know, a lot of our friends work, in, work for composers that work for people that say, I've, I've got a big project and I need you to, to uh, score a couple of, of, of scenes for me, uh, a couple of things. And they go in there and, they, and they, they have the knowledge and they have, they went to school to learn how to do this. They know it's a, it's, there's a lot of mechanical knowledge here. Uh, you're basically engineering a nice piece of work to go here. And you have to fit a scene and you have to have imagination and you sit down and you write and you make more money. So, so, so you know, it's not by the page, sometimes it's by the bar. But a guy will make uh, 5,000 bucks in a day and, and uh, I haven't made $5,000 since I moved here 10 years ago. <laughs> I got a lot of doors in the backyard, though. 
<laughs> but, but I, I, this, I wanted to ask you this um, and at least mention this because it, it, it's worth mentioning because you told me this before we started. Um, you have a new album coming out that's long overdue. Can yeah, you talk about that we really have, quickly? This is, this is a great project. We, we found these. First of all, having the energy of, of uh, David uh, Joyner, uh, who, who just says, I got busy. I, I thought about it, and I sat down, and I wrote three tunes last night, and here they are. And he brought them into a rehearsal. Now I got this, and I wrote this, and I'm, now I'm writing a suite. And uh, my wife Linda has a feature, and, uh, uh, and then uh, you have a feature, and then there's a, a feature for the bass player, and we recorded all this music, and it's it's it, it came out beautifully, and uh, it's just something unique that I I I'd never had happened in L.A. You know. And uh, and everybody played beautifully, and and we're happy to put it out. And then um, we're right in the process of, of 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 putting an album cover together now. The music is ready to go in that cover, but it can't. It got to have something, you know, to put it in, and and it got to tell a story, and it, you know. Is this going to be on a label or self-released? Well, my, or? I always use my, the one I've had for years. I call it Bosco, Bosco Records. Bosco was a great Dane, and uh, his picture was on the labels, and he was, he was perfect uh, uh, for the job because he didn't care what, what you did, just as long as he got fed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so... Um, and then something like this, uh, I still think it's possible that if you if you if you have this CD and you, people hear it, uh, there's a better than even in chance that it'll be easier for you to get a job for this band somewhere if you have something to represent that that band. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that lately. Is um, and some people still do buy CDs. I I, I see that all the time. Where's it going? A, yeah. No, Who I knows? mean, CDs are going to disappear pretty soon, right? Some people still have CD players. I don't know. It's like a lot of people now are buying oh, I, records, too. You know, there's, there's the retro part of it. I still have a lot of records I, that I made years ago that could easily go back on the market. A few of them cases are holding up old engines in my garage. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, it's gone to downloads. You know, and the only thing I could say about that is be careful because I'm being downloaded for stuff that I was never paid for. Uh, I guess iTunes. I was, I was iTunes has uh, my life, and they're selling it. I never agreed to anything like that. Uh, my agreement was with CD Baby. How did they get under the picture? You know. No, I, I, was, I was agreeing with you in that the CD... When you, a lot of artists that are still making CDs now are looking at that as almost like a business card because you could use that as like here's here's what we're doing. But some people they they still want to just you know that's that's too cumbersome for them to put a CD in a CD player. They just want to have an MP3, you know. So I have no answers. I don't know. People are getting really lazy, aren't they? Yes, yes, that is true. <laughs> we need to I wrap want up this here because music in, just put it in my arm like a, like that, you know. Yes, I'm we a symphony. <laughs> <laughs> we need to close here because we got to do the sound check for the next thing. Um, so before before we do this, number one, Pete, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Oh, I'm enjoying it. I, you know, I brag about <laughs> how much fun we had. First of all, it's it's a it's one of the ways to make a living that you really enjoy. You having fun doing what you're doing, and that that's another reason to be a musician. You know. Um, and because uh, I've always had, do you realize that 20, 20 years on The Tonight Show, there wasn't a time when there wasn't something so funny you could ha hardly catch your breath. Yeah. I mean, it was just one big laugh after another. And, and, and that was the joy of it and uh, being appreciated. Johnny was there for us. I don't think anybody else in the building would, 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 wouldn't blink at selling that band and putting the money in their pocket and having a monkey with an organ grinder there. Uh, but Johnny wouldn't have it because he was a musician's musician loving kind of guy 
and he loved to play, and he had all musicians. God, we had, we had Pavarotti on the show. Yeah. And we had uh, uh, Bill Evans and Tony Bennett with Bill Evans, which was unique because Bill had, you know, his life was kind of a, 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 a medical mystery, how he lived through all the stuff he did to himself. And then he, here's, here he is with, uh, with Tony Bennett, and he was completely clean. In a suit, all man, all spiffed up. His, he had a, a complexion. He was actually looked like you know when I saw him the first time when I was a kid. It, 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 he was so under. He was he looked like Marcel Marceau, completely white, and he was playing the piano with his head underneath the keyboard, and he was playing like this, like a spider. <laughs> You know, geez, strange but true. Well, I have I have many more questions, but no time to ask them, so we'll have to do this again. Thank you for being here and, and uh, sharing your stories with us again and your wisdom. And uh, thank you for those of you joining us online and, and here in the theater. Um, and if you have any questions that we didn't get to today, please feel free to put them in the comments after the fact, and we can get to them. Um, and of course, thank you to our sponsors, Museum of Glass, KNKX, Ted Brown Music, Tacoma Creates, Titus Will Cars, and um, Edward Jones Financial Consultant, Rick Gray. This wouldn't be possible without their support. If you find value in these interviews and the music and all the uh, programming that we do throughout the year, feel free to make a donation online. You can do that via Venmo or PayPal or mailing a check. And that information is at the beginning of this post. And um, I've mentioned this before in other videos, but the majority of the work that we do throughout the year is 100% free to participate in and all ages. So that's very important to us. And thank you for helping us make that possible. And uh, we're going to take a very short break here, do a quick line check, and then play some brand new music for you. So hope you enjoy it. Stick around. Thank you so much. The sound of one hand clapping. Yeah. <laughs>